Well, of all of these, the one that you're most likely to need on the exam is this one. You're very likely to have a problem that has both omega and v in it. Now, usually when you're solving physics problems, physics is in a sense like algebra. Your goal is to get as many equations as unknowns. And if you've written down as many equations as unknowns, then you can solve for only all the unknowns if your algebra is good enough. Well, one thing that's frustrating now that we're working with rotation is that we're introducing new variables. And the more variables you have, the more equations that you need. Now, instead of just having v, we also have omega. But that's not really a problem. So you, you, um, you're very likely to have a problem that has both a v and an omega in it. But then you can always get rid of one of those using this equation and reduce the number of variables. That's what we want to do, right? Reduce the number of variables. So this is the equation you're most likely to need on the test. What you're most likely to need is you'll have some equations that have both v and omega in them. Well, then you can get rid of all the v's and replace them with r omega. And then you're one step closer to having a solution. Actually, there's a pretty good chance this one might come up too. When you're working, uh, this is likely to come up when you're working with energy, because energy is in terms of v squared, and rotational kinetic energy is in terms of omega squared. Right. So if you're working with energy, you're likely to have a translational energy with one half mv squared and a rotational energy um, with one half i omega squared. Well, that's too many variables, but you can get rid of one of those variables always using this equation. So you're very likely to have a conservation of energy problem, and then you'll have to use this to reduce the number of variables. Or if you're working with net torque, well, the equation there is that net torque equals I times alpha. But you're very likely, when you're working with net torque, you're very likely to still have to use net force as well. You might need all of these equations together. Well, again, oops, I wrote this wrong. Now, one equation has an alpha and one has an A. But you can always get rid of one of those variables by using this equation. So that's very likely to come up as well. If you're doing a problem using Newton's second law, where well, you're likely to have Newton's second law both for rotation and for translation. And then you can reduce one, get rid of one of these variables by using this equation. But when you do that, you've got to remember this only will get you the right magnitudes. You have to put in the right sign. That's something that's very hard for people to remember to do. It doesn't matter here because we'll be squaring if we're doing it with energy. But here we've got to get the signs right. What is the symbol for force? Um, a capital F. Good. Force is a capital F. What is the unit for force? Newton. So there you know that. Now, do you know what's the rotational analog of force? I don't know that. That would be torque. Um, torque is the rotational analog of force. Now, what is a force? So that means torque mm -hmm. is force? Ah, it's analogous, but we don't want to say that it is. After all, if they were the same thing, why would we need a whole new concept? Right, okay. It's, to, it's the same as the relationship between V and omega. We okay. certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to say that V is omega. We saw there was a big difference right. between them when we did our example here, because we saw that everyone on the merry-go-round had the same omega, but different Vs. So they're certainly not the same thing, but, they are, but we also saw how they're analogous. For example, they play the same role in kinematics equations. So we want to say these are analogous concepts. Things that are true for translational concepts in terms of these concepts tend to also be true for these rotational concepts, even though they're different. Well, what is a force? A force is a push or a pull. But now we be, can be more precise. A force is a push or a pull that causes, that affects your translational movement. Well, a torque is something that affects your rotation. It really is a little bit tricky to see the distinction between force and torque, because all torques come from forces. Torques are always generated by a force. However, the problem is some forces are more effective at causing rotation than other forces. Um, so, not, uh, even if two forces even if two forces have the same magnitude, they're not necessarily going to have the same torque. Well, this will be clear as we go along, so let's keep going. 
maybe we have an object here, uh, this say this is the axis of rotation, and we might consider pushing on it, like this. Um, well, let's say that we increase the force that we're pushing with. Would you expect that to increase the torque or decrease the torque? Would that cause more or less rotation, all of the things being equal? If we push with more force, should there be more or less rotation? More. Yeah, so should the torque be bigger or smaller? Because the torque is telling us how effective we are at causing rotation. So, which of these equations makes sense? Should we say that the torque depends on the force or the reciprocal of the force? Um, Remember, we want these to move in the same direction. Torque. Yeah, we want it to be in the numerator. Because if it was in the denominator, they would be inversely related. Well, they're not inversely related, they're directly related. Well, so far, this is just common sense. The bigger the force, the bigger the torque. But now let's consider two forces that are being applied at different points on the object. Two forces that are being applied at different points. Do you know which of these would be more effective at rotating the object? That, the far one. Yeah. The one away from the point. Yeah. The further away you are from the axis, the easier it is to rotate the object. Um, so say here, um, it's very easy when I push here to rotate around the hinge on my fingers. But over here, it's actually a lot more difficult to rotate around the hinge because my finger is so close. And what would happen if I pushed directly on the hinge? Well, now, it doesn't matter how hard I push. I can push as hard as I like, but there's not going to be any rotation. There might eventually be translation, but you cannot cause rotation by pushing directly on the, on the pivot. You cannot cause rotation by pushing directly on the pivot, and you can only cause a little rotation by pushing close to the pivot. It's only when you're pushing further away that you're going to get more rotation. Um, if you think about doors, are the door handles next to the, uh, next to the hinges or far from the hinges? Far. Yeah, you might never have thought of that before, but uh, if there was a carpenter that put the handle next to the hinges, they would get fired pretty fast, right? Because it would be much harder to open and close a door if the hinge was right next to the hinges. Um, you, want to put the hinge, you want to put the handle as far away from the hinges as possible because the further away you are from what you're rotating, the more effective you are at causing rotation. Now, what's our name for how far we are from the axis of rotation? That was R, remember. R is our distance from the axis of rotation. So in this first case, R was 2 meters. And in the second case, R was 4 meters. So when R gets bigger, would we expect to get more or less rotation? More. So should R, at big R, should that lead to a big torque or a small torque? Big. So should I put R in the numerator or the denominator here? The numerator. Just like F. Both of these have a direct relationship on the torque. This force would be twice as effective as this force at causing changes in rotation because it's twice as far out. And again, just for review, what would the torque be if you push directly on the hinge? Zero. Zero. You can see that from the equation because r would be zero. For some reason, sometimes the simplest cases are the hardest ones for students. Students tend to get really confused about what the torque is here because they can't draw r. Well, you have to remember that lots of things can be zero in physics. So the torque here would be zero because r is zero. And again, we just know that from common sense. You can't make something rotate by pushing on the pivot. But there's even one more complication, although now we can already see that torque is not the same thing as force. Because you can see here we have two equal forces that provide completely different torques. Mm -hmm. Two completely um, equal forces, but different torques. This torque is going to be twice as big as the other torque. Um, in particular, this torque would have been 16, right? Mm -hmm. And this torque would have been 32. So this is what I meant when I said that torques generate forces. I'm sorry, forces generate torques, but they're not the same thing. Every torque has to come from a force. Every torque has to come from a force, but it's not the same thing as the force. Let's just emphasize that a little bit more. Let's put in another 8 Newton force that's pushing directly on the pivot. What would the torque be from that? 
that's right. So obviously, there's a difference between the torque and the force. Mm -hmm. 